our new cars for 64 look better than ever. And they are, from Imperial on down. Every model is loaded with new design features and refinements for longer, trouble-free service and better performance. My service manager friend Pete over there has asked me to help him explain the highlights of the new cars to Jim. We'll use the new Imperial because it has so many of the new features that are found on our other cars, as well as some exclusive features of its own. Hi, Tech. Jim and I are all set to start looking over this new Imperial. Right. Let's begin under the hood. I've heard there's a lot that's new there. What's the word on this new diaphragm-type choke mechanism, Pete? The diaphragm uses engine vacuum to partially open the choke valve and prevent flooding as soon as the engine starts. This arrangement eliminates the choke piston and gets rid of a major cause of a sticking choke. Of course... It's still a good idea to periodically apply carburetor solvent to the choke shaft bearings to keep the choke operating smoothly. But don't get any solvent on the diaphragm unit. It might damage the diaphragm. I'll watch out for that, Tech. Does this choke require any adjustment? This new design affects the vacuum kick adjustment. Uh, tell him about it, Pete. Okay. As you know, Jim, the thermostat spring holds the choke closed during cranking when the engine's cold. As the engine starts, vacuum at the diaphragm opens the choke just the right amount to keep the engine running. And that's what we call vacuum kick. To test the vacuum kick adjustment, you'll need an outside source of vacuum, like a distributor test stand or even a line from another engine. Apply at least 10 inches of vacuum to the diaphragm and insert a drill rod of the specified size for the carburetor you're working on between the choke valve and the wall of the air horn. You should feel a slight drag on the drill rod when you hold a light closing pressure on the choke. If the opening isn't right, you'll have to remove the choke link and bend it to get the proper adjustment. Never try to bend the link without removing it first, or the chances are you'll damage the linkage. I'll remember that point, Tech. Do you have any more tips on carburetor service? Here's one that applies to all our 1964 carburetors with four barrels. Adjust the secondary throttle linkage the same way as on last year's four barrel jobs. But be sure to use 1964 specifications for the adjustment. Check the carburetor story in your reference book, Jim. It's important. I'll do that. Now, what information can you give me on the new crankcase ventilator valve? The new crankcase ventilator system requires less service than previous ones did. However, it should be checked at least every six months. But that's easy to do. Just make three tests. With the engine running, remove the oil filler cap and hold a shipping tag on the tube long enough to allow a vacuum to build up. A vacuum strong enough to hold the tag against the tube indicates that the system is operating effectively. To check the valve itself, Lift the valve and cap assembly from the rocker cover while the engine is idling. You should be able to hear and feel the vacuum at the valve inlet if the valve is working as it should. To make sure the valve is still controlling ventilation, shut off the engine and shake the valve. If you hear a clicking noise, the valve is okay. If a valve is defective, replace it. Don't try to clean or repair it. If the valve is okay, but the system doesn't work, check for a restriction in the hose or in the carburetor passages. I'll remember that, Pete. Now, can you give me any information on the new optional Dodge and Plymouth 426 engine? The new 426 cubic inch V8 with a single four-barrel carburetor gives outstanding performance thanks to its long-duration camshaft, longer valve springs, and pistons that increase the compression ratio to 10.3 to 1. Yes, and you'll be glad to learn that taking care of this baby doesn't call for any unusual precautions or special service. Just normal maintenance keeps it in shape. You'll find more details in the reference book. That's good to know, Tech. Can you two guys give me anything new on servicing our slant six engines? Sure can, Jim. To begin with, Although compression ratios in both six-cylinder engines have been increased for 64, basic ignition timing specifications haven't changed, and both engines still use regular fuel. 
The six-cylinder oil pump has depressions inside the cover to provide pockets for catching any condensed moisture in the oil. If it freezes, it can't damage the pump in this location. Sounds good. Are there any precautions in servicing this unit? Be sure you install the cover with the arrow pointing up, or the pump won't work. Can this cover be installed on earlier sixes that have had trouble with a frozen pump? Yes, it can, Pete. Now, suppose you give Jim the rundown on the new series wound starter on the 170 cubic inch slant six built in the States. I'd be glad to, Tech. First of all, the starter for the 170 cubic inch engine has all four fields wound in series. There's no shunt winding. This feature produces better cranking characteristics at low temperatures. A dab of white paint on the case identifies the series wound starter. In other respects, it looks just like our other gear reduction starting motors with compound series shunt windings. The series wound starter is easier to service because there's no shunt coil lead to unsolder and resolder. Otherwise, it's serviced the same as the compound starting motor. Right, but don't ever replace the armature of a series motor with one for a compound motor, or you're likely to get a lot more noise and vibration. Okay, Tech, I'll keep that in mind. Before we lower the hood, I'd like to mention some improvements in the new Imperial Air Conditioning Unit. A new compressor clutch and a smaller pulley are used on this unit. Consequently, the compressor runs at a higher speed. So engine speeds have to be reduced about 10% for service tests. The proper engine speeds for these tests are specified in the reference book. Is the temperature sensitive fan drive unit on air conditioned cars the same as the one that was introduced as a running change on some 63 models, Pete? Yes, it is, Jim. It's a viscous drive unit that practically free wheels, except when fan cooling is required. So don't condemn one of these units because fan speed is low when cooling isn't needed. However, the fan on the 300K does not have the temperature sensing feature. And you'll notice that all factory installed air conditioning units in every car model have a new aluminum condenser. If an aluminum condenser is ever damaged, it should be replaced. They can't be successfully repaired. Remember that, Jim. And notice this. O-ring seals are now used at all refrigerant line connections on all units except Valiant and Dart. Say, that reminds me. The factory installed Valiant and Dart air conditioning units have been redesigned for 64 to give more foot room up front. I'd like to add another under-the-hood service tip. If you have to remove any engine compartment splash shields for access to the engine, don't neglect to reinstall them when your work is done. They protect the ignition system from road splash and shield other vital parts as well. No, that's right. Our engineers worked long and hard to design these splash shields and put them in just the right positions. So don't you destroy that protection by forgetting to put the shields back. With both of you guys to remind me, how could I forget? Now, can we close the hood and see what's new inside the car? Yep. And while we're getting in the front seat, someone better change this record. Well, Jim, now that we're comfortable, where do you want to start in here? Let's talk about the new instrument panels first, Pete. Okay? Fine. You'll notice the Imperial Instrument Cluster now uses a printed circuit with thermal type gauges. The printed circuit and gauge assembly are removed as a unit after removing the bezel, the lens, and the faceplate. And remember, you have to remove the Imperial printed circuit panel and gauges to remove the speedometer for service. If you don't do this job just right, you could run into trouble. So check the reference book. The Imperial Instrument Cluster is illuminated by new wedge-shaped bulbs. To remove them, you first remove the bulb and socket from the panel, then pull the bulbs straight out of the socket. The standard size Dodge also has these wedge-shaped bulbs. And don't forget that. Okay, Tech, I'll remember. Speaking of the Dodge instruments, let me give you a tip on removing the instrument cluster from the panel. Pull the cluster straight out when you remove it rolling it out slightly from the bottom, as you do. If you lift up on the cluster or roll it out top first, 
You're apt to damage the printed circuit board. The same precaution holds true for removing the Chrysler instrument cluster. But the clearances aren't quite as close. Thanks. That information will come in handy, I'm sure. After you've removed the cluster to troubleshoot the thermal type gauges, identifying the voltage input terminal to the gauge voltage limiter can be a problem sometimes. To find the input terminal on the Dodge printed circuit panel, just trace the printed circuit from the center of the voltage limiter to the terminal pin and connect battery voltage to this pin for tests. The Plymouth input terminal is the pin nearest to the speedometer. On all other cars, the voltage limiter is integral with one of the gauges and the input terminal is marked I. Those tips will make instrument panel service a lot easier, Pete. Now, before we leave this general area, do you have anything on servicing the optional tilting steering wheel on Imperial, Chrysler, and Dodge 880? I can answer that, Pete. The new tilting steering wheel is a trouble-free design that should give you no unusual problems. But when service is necessary, you'll find there are some new special tools to help you do the job. Thanks, Tech. I'll remember that. Now, what's next? I think the new method of installing seat belts for bench-type front seats is worth mentioning, Jim. On bench-type front seats, the two center belts are crossed over so that the driver's belt is anchored on the right side of the tunnel, while the passenger's belt is anchored on the left side of the tunnel. This installation is neater, and it provides more foot room for rear seat passengers, too. Yes, that is an improvement, isn't it? Say, Pete, what's the inside story on transmissions for 64? There are a number of new features in the 64 torque flight, Jim. For example, a new internal full-flow oil filter takes the place of the previous filter in the oil line. In normal use, this filter is good for the life of the car. Here are three of the ways in which the service life of torque flight transmissions has been extended. The diameter of the input shaft has been increased at the undercut. Pinion shaft lock pins are improved, and the torque converter impeller hub is induction hardened because of a number of quality improvements like those you mentioned, Pete, periodic transmission oil changes have been eliminated. You'll notice that there's no longer an oil drain opening in the pan on standard talk flight passenger car transmissions. I see that there's a new console-mounted lever control for torque flight in the Chrysler 300 and some Dodges and Plymouths, too. Right. And remember this. In the transmission used with the console-mounted lever control, there's a new neutral starting safety switch and a different valve body and transfer plate assembly. These parts are not interchangeable with parts from a torque flight used with push buttons. And cable adjustments are different, too. I'll remember that, Pete. Now, how about giving me the word on the new four-speed manual transmission with floor shift? This transmission is fully synchronized in all four forward gears. The shift linkage is simple, positive, and easily adjusted. The linkage has two shift lever over-travel stop screws. They should both be adjusted so there's 30 thousandths clearance between the tip of the screw and the shift lever when the transmission is in gear. That's all there is to it. Well, that's certainly no trouble. Are there any other changes in the drivetrain that'll affect us technicians? I can give you some advice on rear axle service, Jim. In all differentials, except Valiant and Dart, there's a new axle shaft thrust block that permits better lubrication of the pinion shaft. Because the shape of the block has been changed, you now have to remove and install it through the bore in one of the side gears. Plymouth and Dodge rear axle shafts are longer and thicker this year because the rear tread has been increased by two inches. So don't try to use an earlier axle shaft in a 64. It'll fit, but you won't be able to get the right amount of shaft end play. I've noticed that there's a sure grip differential for Valiant and Dart this year. That's right. It's serviced the same as the bigger sure grip units, except tighten the case bolts to only 35 foot-pounds when you reassemble the unit. There's no axle shaft thrust block in the Valiant and Dart sure grip, so don't look for it. It's not needed since axle side thrust is controlled by the wheel bearings in these cars. 
That figures. But it could lead to confusion if someone expected the new units to be identical to their bigger cousins. Well, we've covered the drivetrain pretty thoroughly. So let's turn to brakes next. Fine. You'll be interested to know that the pedal for all factory-installed power brakes is lower this year, bringing the pedal conveniently close to the level of the accelerator pedal. That reminds me. The new Chrysler Dodge, Dodge 880 in Plymouth, power brake units have a stamped shell. They look alike, but the Plymouth and Dodge unit has a spot of black paint on top, and... The reaction values differ from the Chrysler and Dodge 880 version, so don't interchange these units. The Plymouth and Dodge automatic brake adjuster has a 30-tooth star wheel for finer adjustment. When you set these brakes up manually, you back the wheel off 15 notches, half the number of teeth. All the other automatic adjusters still have 24 teeth, and the adjustment is 12 notches. Incidentally, it's important that you use the correct adjusters on every brake, or the automatic adjustment won't work. The reference book has the whole story and shows how to identify the adjusters by the grooves in the pivot nuts. Thanks, Tech. That'll come in handy. Now, here's something else I've noticed. The Imperial and Luxury New Yorker parking brake design has been modified for 64. The bell crank is now mounted on the passenger compartment side of the firewall, eliminating one cable. That's right, Jim. But there's no change in the parking brake adjustment procedure. You know, it's about time we got around to mentioning another big improvement in this new Imperial. I'm referring to the new window lift mechanism. Imperial's new standard power window lift mechanism still has the double arm regulator. But now, the complete assembly is mounted firmly to a rigid box section cross member in the door or quarter panel. This gives the owner an even greater impression of solid quality. The unitized window actuator is smaller, but more powerful than last year. The actuator motor and gear are permanently aligned for quiet operation and long service life. Here's a feature that Imperial shares with all Chryslers and Darts, and with Plymouth and Dodge two-door hardtops, too. Rear windows in these cars Use an offset design weather strip that seals better and looks neater. You remove and install the rear window and its weather strip as an assembly. It's easier than trying to remove the glass or install it by itself, with the weather strip still attached to the window opening fence. That's a good tip, Pete. Now, do you have any suggestions on the new door latches used on most of our new models? The new latches are even safer and more reliable. But there's nothing new to learn. You adjust the new guarded safety door latch the same way you adjust the previous latch. But don't forget to reinstall the shims between the striker and the pillar if you ever remove the striker. Okay, I'll remember that. And all the other tips you two have given me as well. That's fine, Jim. But it looks like that's just about all the time we have for now. Too bad. I was hoping to get some more information from you guys. <laughs> Good boy, Jim. This is one time when it pays to be greedy. Actually, there's still a lot more information available on our 1964 models. Enough to fill a book. In fact, a reference book. So spend some time with your copy of the reference book for this session. And you'll know what's in store for 64. 64.